There's a question that the Buddha has us reflect on every day. Days and nights fly past, fly past. What am I becoming as they fly past? The Thai translation of that passage is, days and nights fly past, what am I doing right now? Which may not be quite literal, but it gets to the same point, because what you're becoming is based on what you're doing. Look at your actions as you go from day to day. Where does your mind gravitate? What things do you tend to think about? What habits are you developing? And if you see that heading in the wrong direction, quickly try to change. Think of that image the Buddha had of the person whose head is on fire. You stir up all your relentlessness, your desire, your mindfulness to put out the fire. It's one of those passages that shows that mindfulness doesn't mean simply accepting things as they are. It means keeping something in mind, keeping the important things in mind. In this case, realizing that you don't know how much time you have. Death is going to come at some point for all of us. We don't know when, but you've got to be prepared at all times because it can come quickly. It's not the case that everybody has a long disease that lets them know oh, this is it. They can say their farewells, they can straighten things out in time. Sometimes it sneaks up on you, and you want to make sure that your mind is in a good state of becoming when that happens. Again, that's based on what you do, what you say, what you think. So look at yourself. Are you heading in the right direction? Are you acting as if you knew that you were going to die? I forgot who it was. So that's one of the amazing things about human beings is they all know they're going to die, but they act as if they don't know. Everybody thinks, I've got all the time in the world. Even people who are old think they're too young to die. But as the Buddha said, all good qualities come from heedfulness, are rooted in heedfulness. And that's what heedfulness means, is realizing you've got to prepare. Because what's going to happen? You can't stay in the body. And the mind will go with its craving. It will cling to its cravings. The craving here doesn't mean simply wishing that things are not the way they are. It's more radical than that. You think about someone dying, what are they going to miss? What are they afraid of being deprived of? Well, one of the things would be sensual pleasure, or the ability even to fantasize about sensual pleasures. And so the mind will tend to go in that direction, especially when there's pain. Most people don't see any alternative to pain aside from sensuality. That's where the mind tends to go. Can you resist that, Paul? It's one of the reasons why we have the contemplation of the parts of the body, how we the contemplation of all the different diseases that any body is subject to. That contemplation on the undesirability of any world that you could go to. And a sense of dispassion for fabrications, any thoughts of the mind. So when you find that you can't stay in the body, and the image of the Buddha gives is of a fire burning a house. In those days they believed that the fire, to get from one house to another house, would have to cling to the wind, get carried over. So in the same way you, the mind clings to its cravings. And you would think, well, if you're going to go where you crave to go, it might be a good thing. Well, craving is blind. And like the wind, it can go any, in which way, especially if you have no control over your cravings. As the Buddha said, the mind can reverse itself so quickly that he doesn't have an image for how quick it can be. You think you're going in one direction, all of a sudden you're going someplace else. So what do you need to develop? You need to develop mindfulness. You need to develop your discernment. These are the two things that will protect you. In 
Krishna craving for sensuality and his craving for becoming, which is taking on an identity in a world of experience. Here again, you're, you're being ejected from this identity that you've held for so long. And the ordinary mind can't conceive that there could be any happiness without taking on a new identity. And so opportunities come up. As you're dying, you can just go for them. And if you're desperate, if you're in a lot of pain or a lot of sorrow, you just grab whatever comes. This is why we try to develop the mind in concentration. Because one of the skills you have to learn to get the mind concentrated is to say no to impulses that would have you think about this, think about that. It's like we have a committee inside. And not everybody is on board with the meditation right now. And some of them would be all too happy to use this hour to think about something else. And you have to get really good at saying no, 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 again and again and again. Until those members of the committee finally realize that you're really serious. And you can settle down. But view that as an an important skill that you're developing as you settle down is learning how to say no to your distractions. Because you think about the importance of what's going to happen at the moment of death. One of the insights the Buddha had on the night of his awakening was that we're reborn in line with our karma. But karma is not a simple thing. It's not like you can tally up how many good things you did and then you subtract how many bad things you did and then you go with whatever number you've got. Different actions can send their re results at different rates. And then there's also just the state of your mind at death. The Buddha said there are cases where people have lived good lives but all of a sudden develop a wrong view at death, thinking that what the mind did was not important, thinking that actions were not important, thinking that all the generosity that they had given, all the precepts they had followed to no purpose. If you think that, that's bad karma, and that bad karma can counteract a lot of the good you've done. It doesn't wipe it out, it just simply means that it's going to go to the head of the line. And the other way around, people who've done lots of bad things in their life, but they suddenly get right view towards the end of the life. Well, that can delay the results of the bad karma that they would have had, taken to a good place. So the, what you're doing as you're dying, the state of the mind in the present moment is an important thing. So here we are in the present moment. So if we know we're going to get mugged here, so we want to check it out. How can we avoid getting mugged? to be really familiar with what the mind tends to do in the present moment, because that's what you're becoming right now, and that threatens to become at the moment of death. Or it could be a promise what you could become if you develop good skills right now. Then there's craving for no-becoming or non-becoming. Some people, when they have a lot of pain, a lot of misery in life, decide that they would just have, like to snuff everything out, they'd like to have everything go into nothingness. That kind of craving, too, could take over at the moment of death. And as the Buddha saw it, it doesn't really put an end to becoming it, it just takes you to some weird places where your awareness gets snuffed out, your perceptions get snuffed out. And depending on how strong that desire was and how strong your concentration is on around that desire, you can stay there for a long time. And you come out and you can imagine what it's like someone who hasn't been thinking and hasn't been receiving any input for a long time. They really have trouble as they begin to have to renegotiate life in a new realm of being. So those are the things that can come and come at you at death. And are you ready? I 
know some people who object to the idea that you have to try to be as alert and mindful as, po as possible at the moment of death. They're saying, here's a person is dying. Can't you leave them alone? Just let them die in peace. Let them relax. Don't make any demands on them. Well, it's not that we're making demands on them. Their own minds are making demands. You know, the minds haven't been trained and they're not alert to the fact that they still have to be mindful and alert, and that their actions at the moment can really make a difference. They don't just give in to whatever comes, and that's not dying in peace. It may look peaceful from the outside, but who knows where they're going. So it's not a kindness to say, well, just leave people alone. The kindness is to say, okay, even at the moment of death, you can still make a difference. You can still use your skills. Because all the skills of meditation are going to be useful at that point. The ability to stay focused, the ability to detect unskillful currents in the mind, and to say no. The ability to maintain your right view, that your actions really are important. And to remind yourself, even though you may have some bad karma from the past, it doesn't have to take over. Some people at the moment of death see bad places opening up, and they suddenly remember all the bad things they've done in their life, and they think, well, I must deserve punishment, and they just go slipping right in. But as the Buddha pointed out, that's not the case. Even though you may have some past bad karma, you can generate good karma right now. It may be difficult if you haven't any, haven't had any experience with the meditation, but if you had had experience with the meditation, that's the time when you want to really use your skills. As a John Fuhring said, when the moment of death comes, remind yourself, okay, this is what I've been meditating for. In English we say that we practice meditation. When you think about how we use the word practice in English, we practice an instrument for the sake of performing. Death is the moment when you perform. So practice well. If you see that your habits, your state of mind, are all heading in the wrong direction, well, you can change that direction. It gets harder as you get older. It gets harder as you get sick. It's possible, but learn how to do it right now. Change things in the right direction. Make that a habit. It'll be a habit you, you will be glad that you had developed. And all too often happens is people look back in their life, they realize so many things where they wasted their time. So live your life in such a way that you will not have any t wasted time to look back on. You can look back and say, well, I spent my time wisely, learned skills that are going to be useful right now. And sometimes just that thought is enough to lift your spirits. So as the Buddha said, you remind yourself all the time, with each and out, every breath, okay? I've got this breath. I don't know about future breaths, but I've got this breath right now. Let's see what I can do, training the mind. A lot can be done. This is called mindfulness of death. It doesn't mean you just think death, 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 death all the time. It means you realize, I've got this present moment. I can make it a valuable present moment. I can accomplish a lot. So there's you get older, you can still accomplish great things even though you're old. As you get sick, you can still accomplish great things even though you're sick. There are cases in the canon where people turn themselves around at the moment of death and we're able to gain different stages of awakening, which means that you can accomplish great things even though you're dying. And that message is not an imposition. 
It's not placing extra burdens on people as they're dying. It allows them to maintain hope and confidence that their actions really do make a difference. So they can focus at that moment on the right things. And not get distracted by things that will pull them down. 